and it's being reported. Okay, so um, since to describe the, the inner electrons, some relativistic effects can be important. Uh, Dirac merged the quantum theory and the relativistic theory in what is called relativistic quantum theory. And almost simultaneously, he also developed a quantum theory for radiation. And uh, well, during the first half of the 20th century, uh, the theory of radiation and the theory of uh, the quantum theory of charged particles were also merged in a more complete theory, which is quantum electrodynamics. Quantum electrodynamics, in fact, is a theory that explains with, uh, with an incredible accuracy any phenomena related to church charged particles and to the interactions between them. That is the fields that transmit the uh, electromagnetic interactions. Hmm? Then uh, other forces were discovered that are very important in, in the structure of the nucleus and in radioactivity, and in particular, the weak forces that deal, for instance, with the beta radiation, with the, the emission of some radioactive uh, atoms, then the weak uh, interactions were also uh, joined with the quantum electrodynamics and uh, a new theory, a new more general theory that is called electroweak theory was developed that includes those two types of interactions and uh, also, it was discovered that a second type of force was important. Uh, the, the strong force is the force that, uh, that explains the stability of nuclei. For instance, the, the, the fact that uh, nuclei contain uh, positive charges, uh, protons, that are in a very, very small volume, and so to compensate for the Coulombic uh, repulsion, we need to introduce a new force, which is the strong force. And then it was developed a model for strong forces, which is uh, quite uh, parallel to the model for electromagnetic theory, a little bit more complicated, which is quantum chromodynamics. And this is what is known as the standard model, which explains um, well, uh, which explains, uh, in fact, uh, the the the, mer the the fusion of the quantum chromodynamics and the electroweak theory uh, led to the grand unified theory, which aims at unifying all the all the forces that are relevant at, at least at a microscopic uh, scale. Eh? But still, physics has a problem, which is that uh, uh, gravitation, that is uh, studied, that is explained by the general relativity, is very difficult to fit into this model, and so uh, there is a strong, there is a lot of work in done to unify the four types of forces that are known in nature. Yeah? That is electromagnetic, weak, strong, and general relativity. Yeah? So there are several attempts to op to develop theories that that include every kind of interaction. For instance, the string theory. Uh, M theory, which is uh, evolution of the string theory, uh, still they have not been able to predict any any result that can be checked experimentally. But um, it is thought that maybe in the future we we could uh, um, we could see a theory that unifies everything. So in fact, we are dealing with a very small part of the whole uh, theory that explains any kind of interactions. But in fact, this 
tiny part, the non-relativistic uh, quantum mechanics is enough to study most the, the vast majority of phenomena that take place in the Earth, at least phenomena that affect us. Hmm? For instance, the whole chemistry, molecular biology, biomedicine, biology, all of them are consequences of electromagnetic interactions, and electromagnetic interactions are perfectly understood. And uh, even if the relativistic effects are important for some, for in particular for internal electrons of atoms and molecules, in fact, relativistic effects can be added a posteriori in a non-relativistic form by means of pseudo-potentials, of theory, and so So, in fact, non-relativistic theory really the main basis that explains all the theoretical aspects of physics and biology. I want to convince you that this theory works incredibly well. For instance, um, well, in fact, by using electrodynamic, uh, quantum electrodynamics, uh, it's possible to calculate the G factor of the electron, which is a measure of the intensity of the intrinsic magnetic moment, spin magnetic moment of the electron. And uh, this constant has been measured with great accuracy also. I have here some data from 2014. And uh, I think there are 13 figures. And the 13 figures have been reproduced by experiment and by theory. And they coincide perfectly. It's difficult to find results of some theory that can be proven, that can be verified with such a great accuracy. You have an idea? Well, the error is one part in 10 to 13. Uh, and you can think of measurement with a similar error. For instance, if you measure the length of a table that is one meter length, uh, long, and an error of this relative error of 2.6 to 10 to 13 would imply that you have to measure it with, um, with an error which is more or less the diameter of a um, hydrogen atom divided in 400 parts. So this is the error you should, you should have for measuring a meter with such an certainty. So the degree of accuracy is really incredible. In fact, not known experimental facts, fact from cosmology to the smallest known scale contradicts quantum theory. <clears throat> well, the predictions of the theory have been very diverse there. For instance, um, antimatter was predicted by Dirac when he merged the quantum and the relativistic theories. And uh, some years after, it was discovered. Uh, the positron, the antiparticle of the electron, was discovered. And there have been many, many predictions of the theory that have been verified and that, and that have led to very important technological advances. Um, well, here, for instance, I have also induced emission. was predicted by Einstein just in the beginning of the development of the quantum theory. And uh, it was the basis of lasers. So uh, uh, shortly after, the physicists realized that it could be uh, the laser uh, was a possibility, and uh, the only problem were technical problems. But uh, as you know, in the middle of the 20th century, they were developed. Mm -hmm. But in fact, this is a consequence of 
theoretical prediction based on quantum mechanics. A particular strict in fact is, uh, is the bose einstein condensate. This is a very special state of matter at very low temperatures that was predicted in 1924. And in fact, in the laboratory, it was realized, this state of matter, more than 70 years after, in 1994. But every, everybody, uh, every scientist, especially in physics, it's was convinced that there should exist that state of matter. Well, predictions of quantum theory have led to the high density, um, this and many, well, flash memory, many electronic devices that are very important nowadays. And as you know, all the, all the fundamentals of chemistry activity, chemical properties of molecules, and so on, are explained by uh, Of course, nanotechnology relies a lot of, upon the quantum theory, etc. And uh, the predictions, still, the, the theory is so strange that uh, even now, almost 10, uh, 100 years after, even now, there, there, has, there, there, has, there have been new uh, discoveries of the theory that could lead to interesting technical applications as quantum theory, teleportation, and so on. In fact, it's, uh, it, it seems that the possibilities that the quantum theory leads to will never finish. Well, but this very exact and very very good theory is really strange. It's, uh, it's, um, it collides with our intuition, which is, which is uh, based on, of course, on macroscopic phenomena. And indeed, the behavior of matter at a smaller scale is very different of this intuition. Yeah? Well, of course, you know that the, the word quantum comes from the fact that there are properties that we thought, according to our macroscopic uh, information, we thought that they were varying smoothly, continuously, and according to quantum theory, we have discovered that they are quantized, that they can have only a discrete collection of values. Of course, uh, you already know probably that uh, uh, classical theories, uh, the physics previous to the 20th century, was deterministic. Quantum theory is not. Even if we perfectly know the condition of a system, we cannot predict the result of measurements done on that system. <clears throat> um, the uh, distinction between light and, uh, uh, in general, between waves and particles is very clear in classical physics. But uh, quantum theory um, gives a picture of, uh, of light as a collection of photons, of a, as a beam of photons, and also a picture of matter as something that can interfere in the same way as as the ways do. Mm. So the frontiers is really not clear, etc. And well, let's go because we lost a lot of time. Let's go to the art. Well, yes, let's, let's make a comment about this. It's funny because there are some points of the theory in particular, the non-deterministic aspects of quantum theory. The non-locality, according to quantum theory, uh, there are some effects that can propagate in some kind of instantaneous way. Eh? And this is the reason why 
entanglement is so important and now it's beginning to, uh, to find application of this uh, strange characteristic of quantum theory. Uh, when two particles are in an entangled state, as we will see, uh, we can measure a property in one of them and instantaneously the effect of such a, of such a measurement affects the other particle. So, in a certain way, we cannot isolate a system because this effect transmits across any kind of isolation. And uh, also, quantum theory uh, have shown us that we cannot make completely objective observations of a system. The effect of the observer in general, change the state of the system. And change in a way that depends on what we decide to observe. So the experimenter is no longer objective as was already thought. Uh, it was already thought that we could always make a measurement in such a way that what we are observing is really the system, not our effect. The effect could be minimized. Quantum theory tells us that this is not possible. And it's funny because, in fact, these points are at the real origin of physical theories. Why, I don't know if it's true that um, Newton was inspired in the fall of an apple to develop his theory of gravity. But, in fact, if he would see that the effect of the, uh, say, the, the high of the apple, the time it takes to reach the floor, and so on. If those parameters uh, were not reproducible, he would not look for any theory to explain it. Uh, the, the idea that, that the phenomena, that the, the phenomena in nature can be reproduced by, by mathematical laws is based on reproduci reproducibility and also on the fact that we can isolate the system in order to simplify it by avoiding interactions with the rest of the universe. And quantum theory tells us that this is not exactly true as we would. Well, let's go on. <laughs> uh, here I have some devastating quotes, devastating quotes by Feynman. Feynman was the, one of the main developers of uh, quantum electrodynamics, and he once said that he feels that nobody understands quantum theory. And also, another quote of the same scientist, the the theory of quantum electrodynamics describes, describes nature as absurd from the point of view of common sense, and it agrees fully with experiment. So I hope you accept nature as she is. Absurd. <laughs> well, uh, but this is, interest, this is an interesting point because, in fact, thanks to this to this non-intuitive character of the theory, uh, 100 years after its development, we are still discovering new consequences that nobody has suspected before. Yeah? As for instance, what I was telling before of teleportation, quantum computing. Well, well let's enter to the main question. Um, some comments about the bibliography. For me, one of the best books, of, of the most pedagogical books of quantum mechanics is the book of Cohen Tanucci. Hmm? There is a French version and an English version. And I consider the, from books I know, maybe this is the best one. Hmm? Another book that is interesting is 
a book by two Spanish, Galindo and Pascual, from Madrid and from Barcelona. And uh, this book is interesting because it's very rigorous from a mathematical point of view. And uh, it, from the beginning, it starts with a formalism of the what we call the um, density operator or density matrix formalism that allows to treat any kind of quantum system, even if we do not know the wave function of the system. In real cases, sometimes we have not enough information about the system to say, well, this system is described by this wave function. And even for those cases, there is a quantum formalism that allows to deal with the incomplete information we have. That is the problem of mixed states. We will introduce it here in order to make a more general introduction of the one you have probably seen in the chemistry graduate courses. And so this, in some aspect, I, I will follow this book. Mm -hmm. Valentine is an interesting book for the questions of interpretation of the theory. Mm -hmm. I, it's, uh, well, I, I like the, the, the questions of the more philosophical questions of quantum chemistry are really interesting. And in the Valentine book, is, they are very well described. Well, and Sakurai, Messia are classical books that are also, also good. And Balian is a book of statistical mechanics that starts from this formalism that I have uh, that you know, the density operator, which is the most general formal with statistical thermodynamics in a quantum framework. And finally, I have some notes that I wrote many years ago that unfortunately they are in Spanish, but they can be also useful to complement this presentation. The presentation and my notebooks are all in the Moodle. <clears throat> when quantum theory, when non-relativistic quantum mechanics was developed, in fact, there were, it was developed uh, in two quite different Okay, I have to put the microphone just in my in my mouth. <laughs> okay, now I I expect it's better now. Well, and uh, a couple of years after. Uh, the Iraq developed a more abstract framework to, for the quantum theory, which is, I, I have called here, a vector, uh, well, quantum. <laughs> it's a formalism that, in fact, uh, allows in a very clear way to see that what, that wave mechanics and uh, matrix mechanics, in fact, are somewhat like a different representation of a more general um, framework, which is vector mechanics, yeah? and is what we introduce here. Yeah? First, we will introduce the formal aspects of the theory, and then we will speak of representations, and we will see uh, what are the particular ways of viewing the theory by Heisenberg and by Rettinger. Well, so let's start with the postulates. First postulate is postulate that ascribe a Hilbert space to every physical system. 
and a unitary ray through every state of that system. Well, uh, each digital system corresponds a complete separable Hilbert space. I will detail what means every word here uh, just now. But let finish reading it. To each pure state of the systems correspond a unitary ray of that space. Any element of that ray can be represent the state. Well, what does this mean? <coughs> well, uh, Hilbert space, in fact, is a vector space that has some particular properties that are related to the fact that uh, this kind of spaces can have uh, an infinite number of dimensions. They are, in general, infinite dimensions. And so this led to some mathematical complications. So the notion of uh, vector space, we have to add some properties that led to the Hilbert space. Uh, Sometimes I will not give a complete rigorous mathematical description of the concepts because it's not really necessary. For instance, in the book of Galindo and Pascual, the, the characteristics of a Hilbert space are very well developed. But in fact, all we have to know is that it's a vector space. That means that vectors, <coughs> that there are elements that we call vectors that can be added that can be multiplied by constants, and that these constants are, in general, complex numbers. And we say that it's a vector space over the field C, the field of the complex number. And um, the other important property of the Hilbert spaces is that they have a scalar product defined need. And uh, the scalar product fulfills the properties of the usual scalar product, as you know, except for the commutation that when, in fact, uh, when we are working in the field of complex number, the scalar products are not commutative. And if we commute, permute the factors, we obtain the complex conjugate. And another important property of those spaces is that they are separable. Separable means that we can always find a denumerable basis set. The discrete, the numerable or discrete are, are equivalent. Uh, the denumerable or discrete uh, basis set. That means that any vector can be written as a linear combination of a basis set that can be infinite but denumerable. Hmm? Um, in quantum mechanics, let me see. Well, of course, the numerable means that we can order them according to natural numbers, for instance, to, n, to integer numbers. Hmm. Well, two words about the dual space. When we found a scalar product, uh, it's a shame that I cannot use the pointer. <laughs> I expect for the for the next day everything works better. But um, now I can use the, the pointer. I, I hope you can follow me more or less. Hmm? Well, I, I have said that in Hilbert spaces we must have defined a scalar product. Yeah, a scalar product. Is, a, is an application that, to every pair of vectors, assigns a complex number. But this scalar product can be viewed also as an application, a type of application, that to every vector assigns a number. For instance, a complex number. For instance, uh, the scalar product between Psi one and psi two can be can be viewed as an application psi one that when it acts on psi two it gives a complex number which is precisely the same as the scalar product 
product psi 1 psi 2 ah let me see ah oh yes it works There's a problem with the image basal resolution. Oh. Well, so ah okay. Let me see if I can okay, okay. I can draw. Yeah. Well, so, uh, this is the notation for scalar product, and we can consider it as an application that, when acts on some vector, gives a number. And so, the space of those type of applications that are called in mathematics, in mathematics uh, they are linear forms, the space made of those applications is called the dual space. And so uh, Dirac, in fact, uh, introduced two spaces. The space of vector of vectors that are normally called get, and the space of application, of linear application over those vectors, which is the space of functions, and it's the dual space. And uh, the, the elements of this space are called bra. And so the bracket notation can be viewed, eh? this can be viewed as a scalar product between two kets or as a bra acting on a ket. Mm? Well, these are two use of the same thing and uh, in fact I consider that to speak about uh, dual spaces is not necessary to develop the theory and uh, so I will only speak of cats that is of elements of the Hilbert space not the dual of the Hilbert space mm -hmm. but I have mentioned the existence of this space because in some quantum mechanics books uh, both spaces are introduced. But in fact, I consider that it is not necessary. So let's let's continue. Okay, by speaking only about one Hilbert space and the space of state vectors. Well, what's a unitary ray? As you probably already know, when we multiply a ket by some complex number of modulus 1, we obtain a different ket which represents the same state. So there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between ket and physical states. In fact, any ket can be multiplied by uh, a phase, which is in fact a ver. okay. This phase is nothing but a complex number of modulus one, and so the collection of one ket and all the other kets that are related with it by multiplying by a phase is what we call a unitary ray. So uh, strictly speaking, to each physical state corresponds a unitary ray. But normally we don't are so precise when we speak about uh, states and we, we will normally speak of cats. It's of course understood that the cat can be multiplied without by a phase factor without changing its physical behavior. Um, see, okay. What's a pure state? Pure states are represented 
by gates. A pure state is a state in which we have the maximum degree of information about the system. This is a question which is not easy to, to specify in quantum mechanics because as you already know, in quantum mechanics we can have a state in which some properties are very well defined and some properties are not. But when we have the maximum degree of information about the system, we say that the system is in a pure state. We will see some examples just now. And if we have not the complete information to specify a single state, a single pure state, a single cat, then we know that we say that the system is in a mixed state. Let's see an example by using systems that you already know. Okay, for instance, let's consider a hydrogen atom. If we know that the energy of the atom is minus one over A, atomic units, eh? so we know that we are in the level n equal to. Uh, we know that the value of L square is 2. Hmm? As you know, angular momenta, the, the, the square of the modulus of any angular momenta, is determined by a quantum number, and if the quantum number L takes the value 1, the observable L square takes the value 1 multiplied by 1 plus 1, that means 2. Eh? So we know that the state has n equal to and that it is a p state. Moreover, let's assume that we know that the z component of the angular orbital angular momentum is negative minus 1 and the z component of the spin angular momentum is uh, say minus 1 half. Then we have the most complete information that it's possible to have about the system. And then we say that this atom is in a pure state and we ascribe to it the state vector psi 2p minus 1. But consider that we have atoms that are emerging from an oven and that we know that all of them are have the energy minus 1 over 8 atomic units, but we have no idea of the angular momentum, orbital or spin angular momentum. Then we cannot ascribe a cat to this state. We say that this is a mixture state or a mixed state. Yeah? So the differentiation is simple. Well, not so simple because, for instance, uh, sometimes we do not have information, say, about the spin of the electron, and we still say that we have a state 2p1, for instance, eh? and we have no specification of, of the spin function. We have no idea if the spin is alpha or beta, is positive or negative. So, the, in fact, we should say, if the relevant information for the applications we are going to study, if we have the, the, the most complete information of what we are interested in, that means if we are not interested in the spin of the electron, we still can forget about the spin part of the wave function and then to consider that the specification to P1 specifies pure state. So the, what is a pure or a mixed state depends on the information we have about the system and of course also on the type of a study we are going to perform about the system. In fact, for instance, in an in atom, the, not in the hydrogen atom because the nucleus is a proton, but in more complicated atoms, 
the state of the nucleus can also change with high energy. And so, to have a complete description of the atom, we should have also information about the state inside the nucleus. But in chemistry, for instance, this is completely irrelevant. So, in chemistry, we will also, al always consider that if we have information about the electronic structure and the motion of the nuclei, the system is in pure state. Well, we, we will go back to this idea in many examples. Well, basic set, of course, you know what it is. It's a set of vectors such that any other vector of the space can be put as a linear combination of the state vectors. In quantum mechanics, we sometimes use uh, basic sets that have a discrete part and a continuous part, as is here. I don't know. Do you, do you see the pointer when I move it across the screen? Now, can you see a hand? Yes, no. Oh. Um. Now, do you, do you see the pointer now? No. Well, let's go back. Okay. I. All right. So. Okay. Here, we have an example of a basic set having a discrete part and a continuous part. You, you know that, the, well, if, if you don't know, I, I tell you, I'll tell you now, that the set of all eigen states, eigenvectors of any quantum operator, the operator associated to, to any property of a system, are a complete set, can be used as a basis set. But sometimes those basis sets have a continuous part and a discrete part. For instance, for a hydrogen atom, the bound states, the states with negative energy, form a discrete set. But the states with positive energy are a continuous set of states. In fact, they, they are not, they, they represent collision states rather than atoms. When we speak of an atom, we think of uh, some stable system. And uh, for stable hydrogen atoms, the energy is quantized, discrete. But for the collision of an electron and a proton, the energy is not quantized. And so, to have a complete set, in fact, we should have to use the states of the discrete, uh, the, the, the vectors for the discrete states and the vectors for the continuous states. Well, but as the, as the Hilbert space are separable, we can always choose discrete basis sets, as the one I have put at the beginning of the slide. Lost, lost point. For instance, in the Hilbert space of the, of the hydrogen atom, we could use the basis set of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian of a three-dimensional harmonic oscillator. And, and it's a good basis. It's as good as the basis made of the uh, spin orbitals of the hydrogen atom. Well, uh, you know that, that those bases can always, always be chosen orthonormal. And, and Well, 
and uh, you already know that uh, it's very easy if we use an orthonormal basis set to obtain the component of some vector. Okay? If we have um, a state vector psi, we multiply from the left side by one basis vector, and what we obtain is the component of that vector along that axis, that basis set, which is quite similar as the way we use to obtain components of a vector in a two or three dimensional uh, physical space. Well, let's speak about measurements. Hmm? Uh, we say that in a pure state, we have to know the maximum degree of information about the system. And this information is obtained through measurements. Um, measurements can be of many types. I mean, for instance, to measure the position of, uh, of a particle, uh, we can let the particle go to a screen and see which is, which is the, the, the signal that the particle has made on a detecting screen. But in this measurement, of course, the state of the particle after the measurement is completely unknown. If we have an electron that collides to the screen, it, it leaves some mark, but afterwards the electron is lost across the structure of the matter of the screen. So it's interesting to speak of ideal measurements, that is, measurements that make the least possible disturbance of the state of the system. For instance, we could measure a position of a particle, but, but, mm, but having a screen with a small hole, and then um, making a beam of particles to collide against the screen. And so the particles that go through this hole have at least two of the coordinates very well determined. Okay? And uh, here I have an example of a system of measuring the momentum of a particle by putting, by letting it go through a region, which is in blue, in which we have a magnetic field that makes the particle follow a circular trajectory and it's easy to see that the, ra the radius of the trajectory is related to the speed of the particle. Mm -hmm. So these are methods of measurement properties that make the least possible dis disturbance of the state of the system. That's what we need to know which is the state of the system, because in quantum mechanics we speak a lot ab about state vectors or wave functions, but how do we know that the state vector is this one or the other? Hmm? This is a question that we will discuss in the uh, shortly. Hmm? Well, okay. okay, let's let's um, let's make uh, a break, yeah, a ten minutes break, and I I will try to improve the system of presentation, because it's really awful. Eh? Uh, we will continue in 10 minutes. I stop recording. All right. Stop, que está al final? Aquí? Donde? See, sound is okay, it seems to be. Well, let's uh, say a couple of words about compatibility between observations. 
that's a very important question in quantum mechanics. Um, in order to, to In order to, to know that we have a system in a, in a pure state, we have to make measurement of compatible observables. And what means compatible? The idea of compatibility is that if we measure one property and then a second property, if these two properties, if these two observables are compatible, the second measurement does not destroy the information previously obtained from the first measurement. And so information is accumulated. Eh? That is the idea of compatibility. Of course, we, it's understood that we are making ideal measurements. If the measurement is not ideal, any information can be lost even for compatible observables. But for instance, if we measure the energy of a hydrogen atom and then we measure the square of the modulus of the orbital angular momentum, since these two observables are compatible, after, measurement, after the measurement of the angular momentum, we still know that the value previously obtained for the energy has not been changed by the measurement. And, and uh, the problem is that in quantum mechanics, there are couples of properties which are not compatible, as you know, for instance, position and uh, a momentum of a particle. Yeah, this is a quite prototypical uh, example. If we have, for instance, let's see, uh -huh. if we have the ground state of a harmonic oscillator, for instance, we know that the wave function is a Gaussian function which has this shape. If we now measure the position of the particle, the, the function changes to a function which is very concentrated on the position we have obtained. That is, if we have obtained the result x1, the position is almost a Dirac delta, a very narrow function that is centered upon this point. In fact, this is not normalized. This should be quite higher because the area uh, should be the same as the previous function. But the idea is that now we have a wave function that is non-vanishing only on a small region about x1. And the width of that region is the, the uncertainty in the measurement. Now we make a second measurement, say, of the momentum speed of the particle. And then if we have a very well determined uh, momentum, we have a wave function which is approximately a plane wave. Uh, an ex well, in fact, it's a complex uh, function which is e to minus i k x. But the real and um, imaginary parts of this function are sinus and cosinus functions that spread about the whole x-axis. So this measurement has lost, has made us lose the information previously obtained about the position. It's impossible to have a, a state vector or a wave function in which we have at the same time the function very concentrating on a point, that means very well-defined position, and at the same time, with a very well-defined momentum, which implies that the function is, is spread about a large part of the x-axis. Um, by the way, I am using the words state vector and wave function in uh, interchangeable, inter, uh, well, as, as synonymous. But in fact, as we will see, they are not. Eh? But for the moment, we will use them as equivalent concepts. Hmm? Well, um, let's go back. Yeah. So 
to prepare a pure state, we have to measure a complete set of commuting or compatible observables. In Spanish, CCOC, <laughs> in English, CSCO. That means that we have to choose enough compatible observables such that after measurement, after measuring all of them, we specify, we always specify univocally the state of the system. For instance, in a hydrogen atom, the Hamiltonian is not a complete set because by measuring the energy, we have not enough information to specify a single state vector. But if we measure the Hamiltonian L square and Lz, then we have the complete information if we are not interested in a spin. So we would say this specified um, pure state if spin is not a relevant observable, if we need to deal with spin properties because we are going to make mm, experiments with magnetic fields, say, then we should also include the spin to have uh, CSCO. Eh? So the CSCO is, uh, is a collection of observables, of compatible observables that determine a single pure state. And they should be non-redundant. That means that um, we have not uh, included in the set any operator, any observable that is a function of the others. For instance, if we have included in a complete set the speed of the particle, we do not need to include the kinetic energy, even if the kinetic energy is compatible with the speed, is compatible with the linear momentum. But it's a function of the linear momentum, and so if we know the speed, we do not know to measure the kinetic energy. So we say that the system should, the, the set of observables should be non redundant. <coughs> well, um, let's go on because this is a question that no longer very relevant. <coughs> Here I have some examples. <coughs> the components of the linear momentum have, uh, are compatible, eh? so we can know the three components with as good accuracy as we, as we like, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for instance the components of the angular momenta are not uh, compatible, and so you know that we can know one of them, but not in general, we cannot the three components in a single state, in the same state. Um, sorry. <coughs> well, Well, so in order to specify uh, a state, a pure state, we have to measure compatible observables. In fact, there are other possibilities. For instance, uh, a way of preparing a system in the ground state could be also to cool the system at a very low temperature. And so uh, we take out the maximum degree of energy from the system, and at the end, we have a system which is in a known pure state. And uh, this is a system also of preparing states after having a known state, say the ground state, by interacting with the system, by, for instance, uh, radiomagnetic interactions, we can change, to change this state to other states. Eh? That's what is done, for instance, in nuclear uh, magnetic experiments. Uh, a sequence of pulses uh, can change a given initial state to several other 
possible states. Well. <clears throat> uh, well, I, here I have an exercise which is rather trivial. Let's have a look. Eh? Indicate Indicate what measurements should we make to prepare a hydrogen atom in the pure states corresponding to the following state vectors. 2p... <laughs> well, the quality is so bad that I cannot read. I think it's 2p1 or 2p-1. Well, we have already seen that the specification of the state 2p minus 1, the 2 means that we know the energy, the p knows that we know L square, and the minus 1 means that we know the uh, z component of the orbital angular momentum. And so these are the three properties that we should measure in order to prepare the atom in this state. I think the the next one is 2p0. Uh, well, not sure. <laughs> I hope it is. Uh, well, that's the same question. It seems rather, maybe it's 2pz. 2pz, in fact, is the same as 2p0. So again, the same three properties are enough to specify that state. And I think the last one, ah, okay, the last one is 2p, ah, no, 2px, okay, okay, that's more interesting. <laughs> 2px. Probably you know from your background of quantum, of quantum chemistry that 2px is not an eigenstate of Lz. In fact, it's a linear combination of 2p1 and 2p minus 1. And so, in a 2px state, we have no information about Lz. But again, this is a pure state. Whenever we know the state vector, we have a pure state. What happens is that sometimes it's not easy to see what is the information that determines a pure state. For instance, what should be measured in order to say that our atom is in a 2px state? One idea is to think about the 2pz. The 2pz state is the same as the 2p0. So if we measure, if we measure Lz and uh, we select well, I have uh, a slide um, before that I've, I've gone through it very quickly. Let me go back. Yeah, I forget to, to discuss this. Probably you already know. This is a typical device to measure Z components of angular momenta. Mm -hmm. For instance, the the spin uh, Z component of the electron can be measured by making a beam of electrons pass through an inhomogeneous uh, magnetic field. And then the, the electrons with positive and negative Z component, uh, we understand that the Z component is the vertical direction. And so this allows to separate the beam into beams which have particles having positive and negative component along that axis. And uh, this can be used to measure any kind, in fact, of angular momentum, because, uh, well, any kind of angular momentum that has associated some angular magnetic moment. But that, that is the case of the orbital angular momentum of the electrons. And so this could be used to measure the Z component also of the angular momentum of a hydrogen atom. Okay? But what about what about 
to be x. Well, in fact, uh, we normally choose as a complete set of observable L square, Hamiltonian L square and L z. And that's because in polar coordinates, the z component has a particularly simple uh, form. <clears throat> but Ah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, had a problem with a mouse that was moving by itself. Okay. So, if we use the same Sternger lack, but instead of putting it in the z direction, we put the magnetic field along the x direction, then we are, of course, measuring x components of the angular momentum. And so if we select the atoms for which the x component is 0, we have the states 2p0, but now this 0 refers to x, to Lx, not to Lz. And this state is equivalent to the 2px. In fact, the 2px uh, is the state with zero component of the x component of the orbital angular momentum. Mm -hmm. And so, in order to prepare the system, the atom in the 2px state, the only thing we have to do is to turn 90 degrees the standard like device. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, the question is that the 2px and the 2pz, for instance, have the same degree of information. In one case, we know the value of Lz. Maybe you could think, OK, in the 2px, we don't know, we do not know Lz, but we know Lx, which is equivalent. And so, in fact, the quantity of information can be quantified. Mm -hmm. I will not enter in these details how to define the entropy of a system, which is related to the, which is the opposite of the quantity of information. But it's easy to understand that the 2px and the 2pz have the same degree of information. Of course, to prepare the 2px, we need to measure the observables of a CSCO, of a, of a complete set of observables different to the observables we need to, to prepare the atom in the state 2px. But at the end, we end with the same quantity of information, energy, L square, and one of the components of L of the angular momentum. Well, let's go on. Well, um, you know that what's a linear operator eh, is an operator that when applied to a linear combination, Uh, linearity, you already know what it is. Eh? Um, let's speak of other important properties of operators in quantum mechanics. Eh? Operators are self adjoint. Ah, let me see, there's a question. But aren't something and F supposed to. Yeah. Okay, le let's. Let's insist, because this is, this is a, an important concept. For a given system, we can have many complete 
set of compatible observators. And of course, depending, well, we, with one complete set of compatible observables, we can prepare a complete collection of states. That is, well, more strictly speaking, a basic set of states. Sí, pero, yeah. Um, uh, let's go back to the hydrogen atom, which is a very interesting example. Um, by measuring Hamiltonian L squared and LZ, let's, uh, let's assume that we are not interested in a spin, so we forget about the spin. With these three properties, we have enough to prepare pure state, as long as we are not interested in spin properties. And so we can, we can prepare a complete set, a, a complete set, a basic set, which is the psi n l m states, the typical hydrogen atoms. But by measuring this these properties, we cannot prepare every pure state. For instance, to prepare the 2px, it's not possible to prepare it by measuring those properties. We have to change Lz by Lx. So we have to use a different complete set of compatible observables. So the set we have to use depends on the state we want to obtain. And so for the same system, we can have, in fact, quantities, an infinity of different sets. And an interesting question is what observables have to, we have to measure in order to prepare a given state. For instance, let's consider a state vector which is a linear combination of the 2s and 2pz. In this state, the two states have the same energy, and so the energy is well defined, n equal to. But L square is not well defined because we have a state which is a linear combination of an eigenstate, an S state in which the angular momentum is zero, and a state with L equal one, which is a non-zero angular momentum. Um, we can, um, well, if, if in the next class I can write, because today I cannot, <laughs> uh, I will write you formally uh, formally, we can cons we can build operators that have those that allow us to prepare that specific state. But probably it's very complicated to found a, a real device, a real measurement device, in order to perform such measurements. Uh, so to prepare any state of the Hilbert space, there should be some complete set of commuting observables. But in general, it's not a trivial question to found what, have, what we have to measure in order to prepare that state. And one CSCO and other CSCO can be incompatible between themselves. For instance, uh, as you have said, uh, Asier, um, the observable L, Lx is not compatible with the observable Lz, but they belong to different CSCOs. So don't matter. Don't be worried about this. The only condition is that within a complete set, the observables have to be compatible. Of course, we can have other sets 
with observables that are not compatible with a given one, with the observables of a given one. Eh? So only within the set, the observables must be compatible. Is that uh, the answer to the question? OK, let's go on. Um, linear operators. Well, a question, a very important question, is that of adjoint and self-adjoint operators. The adjoint A dagger of an operator is defined that way. If we have, uh, when we have a scalar product in which we have the A operator acted on any vector space, then the adjoint operator of A is an operator that, when acted on the other side of the scalar product, on the left-hand side of the scalar product, give the same result, the same scalar product, as the original operator acting on the right-hand side. Eh? So, in practical terms, in order to move A from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, we have to put the dagger, we have to, op to change the operator by its adjoint. Mm -hmm. And uh, we say that an operator is self-adjoint, that the effect on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side is the same. If a if a has the same effect or the same effect on the right hand side and on the left hand side well this is not exactly true eh? the result of applying a to the vector on the right hand side and to the vector on the left hand side if both left if both led to lead to the same scalar product for any couple of vectors, then we say that the operator is self-adjoint. Hmm? Well, um, OK. Uh, of course, you know what is a commutator. Yeah, we have already seen. And uh, um, we will see it afterwards, but uh, you know also that the commutativity is the mathematical way of verifying that two observables are compatible. Eh? So commutativity and compatibility are, are usually interchangeable terms. Hmm? Well, with this, with this information, we can go through the second postulate. The second postulate, the two first postulate, in fact, are the are only definition of a definitions of the mathematical framework in which quantum mechanics will be developed. Eh? The third postulate is the more physical one, but the first and the second are only mathematical uh, aspects. Eh? The second states that for each physical observable of a physical system, it corresponds a linear self-adjoint operator acting on the elements of the Hilbert space. The operators corresponding to the Cartesian position coordinates of the spin particles and to the conjugate momenta, linear momenta, must satisfy the following computation relationships. The two position operators always commute, two momentum operators always commute, they can be different components or even the components of the momenta of different particles. Any couple of Qs and any couple of Ps give the commutator zero. And the commutator of a position, a Cartesian position coordinate and, and the conjugate momenta, momentum, commute unless they refer to the same coordinate. Yeah? That is zero if i is different to j and is 
um, h bar, i h bar, if they are the same index. Yeah? So this is the only case in which these operators do not commute. For instance, the x coordinate of a particle and the uh, px component of the momentum. Um, this is a more general way of introducing the vectors for position and momenta. You probably have seen the position as an uh, operator that multiplies by the coordinate, the corresponding coordinate, and the momenta as derivatives of coordinates. Mm -hmm. This is the particular expression of the operators in what we will call position coordinate representations. But in general, we can choose any operators for P's and Q's that fulfill these, these commutation relationships. This is enough. Well, mm, there is a question here. When we have a product of coordinates, then we have take care uh, to symmetrize the product in order to obtain the corresponding quantum operator. For instance, if we have the product of x and px, since they do not commute, of course, in classical mechanics, you can write them in, in, in whatever order, and the result is the same, but not in quantum mechanics. So when this happens, in order to build the corresponding operator, you have to take the two products to add them and to take the average, the one half of the sum of xp plus px. Yeah? So in cases when you have a product of two non-commuting operators, you have to take care of this. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I have here typical examples you already know about uh, properties. Well, in fact, I have not read the, the complete statement of the postulate uh, for operators that are not uh, coordinates or momenta. The idea is that you take the classical expression, write it in terms of position and momenta, and then use the uh, substitution by the corresponding operators for x and for p, for, for coordinates and for momenta. Eh? We have here an example, the angular momentum can be put in terms of position and momenta coordinates, and it's straightforward to obtain the corresponding expression of the quantum operators. Eh? Um, this is the example I, I have just told you about an operator which is a product of a coordinate and a momentum, then the operator should be this one. Eh? And for observables that do not depend on the classical coordinates and momenta, we have to invent, in a certain way, operators that led to the physical properties that make us have made us discover these, these observables. Well, in particular, this is only relevant for a spin. Okay? There are experiments, or the stenger lack experiment, that has shown that uh, particles have an intrinsic magnetic moment, which is the spin, and the operators corresponding to the spin components are built in such a way that the eigenvalues of those operators correspond to the results that are obtained when measuring the spin. Okay? So for operators with no classical analog, the special expression has to be obtained in order to reproduce the experimental facts that have shown the existence of those properties. Pues, okay, well, here I have an exercise that um, some, some points, you have already checked them, some properties of commutators, 
I think you have already seen them in the first part of the course. I have collected them here, but um, you can you can try to show some of them in order to practice a little, and then the next day we will we will discuss it discuss it a little. Okay? Um, since this part of the subject has an exam, I will not um, put you a lot of work, homework, but there are some exercises that I think it's interesting to try to do it, and if you have any problem, we can discuss it here afterwards. Yeah? Sometimes I will give you some small, some short exercises to do as homework, yeah? but uh, it will be only in certain special cases. Yeah? But even if you, well, try, try, have a look yeah, and try, try to verify this. For instance, to verify that here, that the commutator of L X and L Y is a H bar L Z. Hmm? Um, you do not need to use a specific representation of the operators. Hmm? By only using the postulate and the previous relationships we have here, it should be enough. Uh, normally, in quantum in quantum chemistry book, in order to prove this, you use that uh, you put the operator L Z, for instance, in term of position and linear momenta, and since linear momenta are derivatives with respect to coordinates. You can make the derivatives and obtain this result. Hmm? Since we have not introduced until now the specific representations of state vectors, you should be able to prove this by using only the definition, the commutation relationships given in the second postulate. Try to do it, and we will discuss it next day. Thank you very much. Well, if you have any question <laughs> before leaving, okay. Uh, I'll stop.